every fall, American children trot off to kindergarten or first grade, starting an educational journey that lasts 13 years or more. As the journey begins, many children can read only a few words and know little math. By the end, most can read complete books, and many have learned algebra and geometry. The mastery of complex academic skills is possible because of profound changes in children's thinking in this period. And intelligence and aptitude tests are a common part of their uh, educational travels. In this lecture on middle childhood, we will see that it involves uh, growing cognitive skills which parallel physical growth and improved motor coordination. Middle childhood is the period between early childhood and early adolescence, approximately from ages 6 to 11. And children are safeguarded by genetic and environmental factors. From an evolutionary perspective, genes protect children who have already survived the hazards of birth and early childhood. Middle childhood has been called the golden age of childhood. Overall, children are relatively healthy during this period. This is a healthy time. There are lower death rates due to immunizations and less lethal accidents and fatal illnesses. There are fewer chronic conditions due to better diagnostic and preventative medical care, less secondhand smoke, better health habits, specialized programs that exist today, and improved oral health. This chart shows the annual death rate per 100,000 by age group, and you can see the low death rate for this middle childhood period. Rates continue to rise with age. Now, this figure does not portray the entire lifespan, but details are remarkable. Uh, not only are uh, fatal diseases rare thanks to immunization, but accidents and homicide also dip during middle childhood and rise rapidly thereafter. The average child gains about 2 inches and 5 pounds per year. Maintenance of good health is related to adult instruction and regular medical care. Camps for children with special health needs are beneficial. In Michigan alone, there are specialized camps for children with epilepsy, such as Camp Discovery, uh, children with cancer, Gilda's Camp Sparkle, and children with diabetes, Camp Medicia, for example. Physical activity during this developmental period is so important. The benefits of physical activity can last a lifetime. Advances occur in physical, emotional, and mental health. There's also academic achievement improvement. Better cerebral blood flow and more neurotransmitters. Better mood and energy. Embodied cognition is aided. This is the connection between the uh, body movement and thinking. Some concerns are that children may suffer harm from sports, including brain injury and other impact-related injury. Children's need for movement may be hampered as indoor activities often replace outdoor play. Economic barriers and disabilities may limit participation in league, club, and other after-school activities. Although this developmental period is considered a healthy time, health problems can occur, one of which is childhood obesity. Many 6 to 11 year olds eat too much, exercise too little, and become overweight or obese as a result. 18% of U.S. 6 to 11 year olds were obese. Since 2000, U.S. rates have leveled off, but Increases continue in most other nations, including the most populous two, China and India. Excessive weight contributes to future health risk increases, average achievement decreases, self-esteem failures, and loneliness. Not only are there health costs associated with childhood obesity, but a child's weight problem is also intimately entangled in his or her emotional world. Studies show that children as young as six years may associate negative stereotypes with excess weight and believe that a healthy child is simply less likable. True, some children who are overweight are very popular with their classmates, feel good about themselves, and have plenty of self-confidence. But in general, if your child is obese, he or she is more likely to have low self-esteem than his or her thinner peers. His uh, weak self-esteem can translate into feelings of shame about his body, and his lack of self-confidence can lead to poor academic performance at school.
In an ironic twist, some children who are overweight might seek emotional comfort in food, adding even more calories to their plates at the same time that their pediatricians and parents are urging them to eat less. There are genetic influences on childhood obesity. Dozens of genes affect weight by influencing activity level, hunger, food preference, body type, and metabolism. However, it's not all nature. Nurture, of course, is involved too. Social context is crucial. Some parenting practices have been linked to obesity. For infants, no breastfeeding and solid foods before four months. For preschoolers, bedroom TV watching and soda consumption. For school agers, insufficient sleep, extensive screen time, and little active play. Exposure to TV ads has been linked to obesity. Nations differ in children's exposure to televised ads for unhealthy food. The amount of this advertising continues to correlate with childhood obesity. Parents can reduce overweight by limiting screen time and playing outside with their children. The community matters as well. When neighborhoods have no safe places to play, rates of obesity soar. A growing body of research suggests that foods sweetened with sugar or high fructose corn syrup can be as addictive as nicotine or cocaine. It's clear too that for most of us, the eating patterns we develop as children hang around forever. Another health problem that can occur is asthma. Asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways that makes breathing difficult. Sufferers have periodic attacks, sometimes rushing to the hospital emergency room. In the U.S., childhood asthma rates have tripled since 1980. U.S. parents report that 15% of their 5 to 11-year-olds have been diagnosed with asthma at some time, and almost 11% still suffer from it. Children growing up in rural areas, around animals, and in larger families seem to develop asthma less often than do other children. According to the hygiene hypothesis, this is due to increased exposure to particular viruses, bacteria, or parasites. The hygiene hypothesis proposes that childhood exposure to germs and certain infections helps the immune system develop. This teaches the body to differentiate harmless substances from the harmful substances that trigger asthma. In theory, exposure to certain germs teaches the immune system not to overreact. In some city schools, asthma is so common that using an inhaler is a sign of pride. Let's move on to look at cognition in middle childhood. Piaget described this developmental period as one of concrete operational thought. Piaget's term for the ability to reason logically about direct experiences and perceptions. A couple of things happen during this uh, period. One is classification, a logical principle that things can be organized into groups or categories or classes according to some characteristic they have in common. Another thing that uh, children accomplish during this uh, concrete operational thought period is seriation understanding that things can be arranged in a series. Seriation is a crucial for understanding the number sequence and logical series. In middle childhood, children develop the ability to use uh, mental categories and subcategories flexibly, inductively, and simultaneously. By age 11, children use mental categories and subcategories very flexibly, unlike at age 6. Piaget recognized that connections allow logical ideas to be applied to uh, many specifics in concrete operational thinking. During middle childhood, the brain increases in its capacity and ability to coordinate ideas and thoughts. Piaget seemed to know what he was doing before brain scans were even around. Today, brain scans can demonstrate the maturation and classification proposed by Piaget neurological pathways from general to particular and back again have been found as a result of brain maturation. As you recall, uh, Vygotsky emphasized uh, the society and culture as crucial in learning. Education occurs everywhere and knowledge is acquired from the social context and instruction is essential. Guiding each child using scaffolding through the zone of proximal development is crucial.
Language is integral as a mediator, a vehicle for understanding and learning. Play with peers, screen time, dinner with families, neighborhood play. Every experience from birth on teaches a child. As Vygotsky recognized, children learn whatever their culture teaches. Fifty years ago, children were in cooking and sewing classes. No longer. This photo shows 10-year-olds Cameron and Caitlin in a Kentucky school preparing for a future quite different from that of their grandmothers. The information processing perspective compares human thinking processes by analogy to computer analysis of data, looking at sensory input, connections, stored memories, and output. Children learn to select relevant units of information, analyze and connect, and express uh, conclusions in understanding ways. This perspective supports the notion that brain connections and pathways are forged from repeated experiences in day-to-day -day learning. Education is, is important, an extensive knowledge base makes it easier to master new related information. Every aspect of language, vocabulary, comprehension, communication skill, and code switching, which we discussed in a previous lecture, advances each year from age 6 to 11. The understanding of prefixes, suffixes, compound words, phrases, and metaphors builds. A child's vocabulary becomes more fine-tuned. Language context adjustment is a skill that improves during this developmental period. And this is through pragmatics, which is concerned with the use of language in social contexts and the ways people produce and comprehend meanings through language. Pragmatics focuses not only on what people say, but how they say it and how others interpret their communication. Without pragmatics, there is often no understanding of what language actually means or what a person truly means when he or she is speaking. Pragmatics is the ability to use words and devices to communicate in various contexts. Pragmatics allow children to change formal, informal, and linguistic codes to fit the audience. An example of uh, how pragmatics influences language and its interpretation uh, is as follows. Uh, imagine you invited your friend over for dinner and your child sees your friend reach for some cookies and says, better not take those or you'll get even bigger. You can't believe your child could be so rude. Uh, in a literal sense, the daughter is simply saying that eating cookies can make you gain weight. But due to the social context, the mother interprets that sentence uh, to mean that her daughter is calling her friend fat. Pragmatics has proven helpful in working with children with autism. When educators and speech pathologists teach these communication skills or social pragmatics to children with autism spectrum disorder, the results can have a big impact on improving their conversational interaction skills. Of course, uh, language is important in education, and some children enter school without an understanding of what's being said. Bilingual education is a strategy in which school subjects are taught in both the learner's original language and the second majority language. ELLs, English language learners, are children in the U.S. whose proficiency in English is low, usually below a cutoff score on an oral or written test. ESLs, English as a second language, is an approach to teaching uh, English in which all children who do not speak English are placed together in an intensive course to learn basic English so that they can be educated with native English speakers. Immersion refers to a strategy in which instruction in all school subjects occurs in the second, usually the majority language that a child is learning. It should not surprise you that there's a connection between poverty and language development. Socioeconomic status affects cognitive development, so there is poor and uh, slower language mastery. Also, smaller vocabularies and impaired grammar compared to those from higher SES families. There's school learning slowdown in every subject. SES affects brain development. Uh, hippocampus development is impacted, and in lower categories, less language 
is heard early in life. Schools may look very similar on the outside, but uh, they vary greatly on the inside. This is due to the hidden curriculum, the unofficial, unstated, or implicit patterns within a school that influence what children learn. Uh, it's not formally prescribed, but it is instructive to the children. Uh, and this involves physical surroundings, teacher ethnicity, and teacher expectations. Uh, variation is quite great in these hidden curriculums. And uh, this variation involves course offerings, uh, schedules and tracking, uh, teacher characteristics, discipline and teaching methods, uh, sports competition, uh, extracurricular activities, student government, and the physical setting. In the U.S., literacy and numeracy are valued everywhere. Uh, geography, uh, music, and art are not essential in all places. Of course, part of uh, the educational process involves standardized testing. And in the U.S., there have been increases in international test scores. The largest disparities appear between incomes and ethnic group test scores. There are national standards, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the NAEP, is given. It's an ongoing, nationally representative measure of U.S. children's achievement in reading, mathematics, and other subjects over time, and it's nicknamed the nation's report card. Disparities have been seen between national and state scores, uh, also Latino and African and European American fourth grade reading and math scores, and in high school graduation rates. In the last section, we look at children with special brains and bodies, which brings us to developmental psychopathology, a field that uses insights into typical development to understand and remediate developmental disorders. It links usual with unusual development, especially when the unusual results in special needs. And it follows four general principles. Abnormality is normal means that uh, everyone has some aspects of behavior that are unusual and uh, everyone with a serious disorder is in many respects uh, like everyone else. Disability changes year by year. Most disorders are comorbid, which means that more than one problem is evident in the same person. And a severe disorder in childhood may become milder, but another problem may become disabling. Life may get better or worse. In other words, uh, prognosis is uncertain. And finally, diagnosis and treatment reflect the social context. Each individual interacts with the surrounding environment, including family, uh, school, um, community, and culture. And this interaction uh, between the two uh, can modify, worsen, or even create psychopathology. Psychologists have developed tools for measuring the mind. These tests help determine how well a student is doing and uh, predict uh, how well a student uh, will do. One is aptitude. Aptitude tests uh, measure the potential to master a specific skill or to learn a certain body of knowledge. Achievement tests measure mastery or proficiency in reading, mathematics, writing, science, or some other subject. Multiple intelligences uh, involves the idea that human intelligence is comprised of a varied set of abilities rather than a single all-encompassing one, which was the idea behind IQ tests. Uh, people assume that aptitude was a fixed characteristic present at birth. Uh, so a general aptitude called G uh, represented general intelligence. It was assumed that G could be assessed by answers to a series of questions and the number of correct answers was uh, compared to the average for children of a particular age to compute IQ. An IQ of 100 was exactly average because it indicated when mental age was the same as chronological age. Gardner said there are multiple intelligences more than are measured by typical intelligence tests. He identified seven intelligences, linguistic, logical, mathematical, musical, spatial, bodily, kinesthetic, interpersonal, intrapersonal, naturalistic, and existential. Uh, the eighth, naturalistic, and ninth, 
uh, spiritual existential were added uh, later. Uh, each is associated with a region of the brain. In education, Gardner suggested that schools are often too narrow, teaching only some aspects of intelligence and thus uh, stunting children's learning. Schools, cultures, and families dampen or expand particular intelligences. Now, brain scans are not accurate in diagnosing cognitive disorders in childhood. However, neuroscientists and uh, psychologists uh, do agree on four generalities. Brain development depends on experiences. Dendrites form and myelination changes throughout life. Children with disorders often have unusual brain patterns and training may change those patterns. Each brain functions in a particular way. And this is referred to as neurodiversity. There are two basic principles of developmental psychopathology which complicate diagnosis and treatment. The first is multifinality, where one cause can have many or multiple final manifestations. The second is equifinality, where one symptom can have many causes. Some suggest that childhood psychopathology was underdiagnosed in early DSM editions and overdiagnosed in the DSM-5. Some children are diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD due to potential problems in three areas, inattention, impulsiveness, and activity. There's no biological marker uh, there is some suggestion of a relationship with brain regulation, and it is often comorbid. In the United States, about 6% of all school-aged children are diagnosed with ADHD. Boys outnumber girls by a 3 to 1 ratio. Now, there has been an increasing incidence of the ADHD diagnosis, and some believe this is due to misdiagnosis due to drug abuse or simply normal childhood behavior being considered pathological. ADHD is typically treated in two ways. First, stimulant drugs such as Ritalin are effective. It may seem odd that stimulants are given to children who are already hyperactive, but these drugs stimulate the parts of the brain that normally inhibit hyperactive and impulsive behavior. So stimulants may calm many youngsters with ADHD, allowing them to focus their attention. Secondly, there are behavioral treatments, typically involving parents, which are beneficial. Some children may be diagnosed with a specific learning disorder. This is a marked deficit in a particular area of learning that is not caused by an apparent physical disability or by an unusually stressful home environment. The DSM-5 diagnosis of a specific learning disorder now includes disabilities in both perception and processing of information, evident in unexpected low achievement in reading, math, or writing, including spelling. Children with specific learning disorders have difficulty mastering skills that most children acquire easily. Here are a couple of the uh, specific learning disorders. Dyslexia is unusual difficulty in reading, thought to be the result of some neurological underdevelopment. And dyscalculia, unusual difficulty with math, probably uh, originating from a distinct part of the brain. Those uh, large prism glasses that this child is uh, wearing uh, keep the letters from jumping around on the page. Uh, which is helpful for this eight-year-old French boy. Unfortunately, each child with dyslexia needs uh, individualized treatment. These glasses help some, but not most children who find reading difficult. Autistic spectrum disorder is uh, any of uh, several disorders characterized by poor social understanding, impaired language, and unusual patterns of play. The cause and treatment are uh, disputed. Equifinality certainly applies to ASD. A child can have symptoms for many reasons. No single gene causes the disorder. That makes treatment difficult. An intervention that helps one child is worthless for another. It is known that biology is crucial. Genes, uh, copy number abnormalities, birth complications, uh, prenatal injury, uh, perhaps chemicals during fetal or infant development, and that family nurture does not cause ASD, but may modify it. Most diagnoses occur at age four or later. Gender and ethnic differences in rates are apparent. 
there are three categories as this lies on a spectrum mild moderate and severe social and language engagement of the child early in life seems the most promising treatment a group of children with special brains and bodies are the gifted and talented. They are high IQ, unusually talented, and unusually creative children and may require special education. Exceptional talent must be nurtured. The needs of unusually gifted children are not covered by U.S. federal laws. Each state selects and implements its own system, and there is controversy about which system to use. Exceptionally talented children have several characteristics in common. They are passionate about learning their subject and have a powerful desire to master it. They are creative in their thinking, coming up with novel thoughts and ideas. Creativity is associated with divergent thinking, where the aim is not a single correct answer, but fresh and unusual lines of thought.